So the positive effects are kind of being worked out compared with where they were. A lot of them involve um, making sure you have adequate protein. There's maybe a little bit of positive association having a good and a poor quality forage together that they sort of stimulate a, a more appropriate uh, microbial consortium. But a lot of that was really protein. And a lot of that is kind of in the beef area. Negative associative effects, I, th I think, uh, you know, kind of proud to say that we've helped to reduce those. So maybe by some people's estimates, maybe half as bad as it used to be, but we still have a long ways to go. So hello everyone, this is Luis Ferrero, one of the hosts of the Dairy Nutrition Black Belt podcast. Uh, and today we have Dr. Jeff Firkins from the Ohio State University uh, joining us for a very nice discussion about fiber degradation and how other nutrients can affect fiber degradation. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff, for joining us today. Uh, I'm certain that our... Uh, our listeners will truly enjoy this discussion. But before we begin with some of the uh, questions that we have for you, could you please give us a brief background about yourself? Sure. Um, so I'm actually originally from Illinois, in Northern Illinois, and uh, grew up on a on a farm, including uh, we didn't actually have dairy cattle, but my my uncle was a couple miles away, and I got plenty of experience on that. I've been at Ohio State since actually the end of 1987, and I've been a, all the way up through the ranks of professor and uh, still just uh, trying to keep busy and, and trying to do important research. This is basically the research we want to discuss. We know that you have a lot of experience with uh, rumen degradation and how the different nutrients not only are digested in the rumen, but how they behave compared to other nutrients. Uh, said that... Why should we care about positive and negative associated effects on fiber degradation? Really good question that I think is not asked enough anymore. So it was a big deal when I was in, in, in school, and it just seems like it's just kind of like ignored. Uh, so the positive effects are kind of being worked out compared with where they were. A lot of them involve um, making sure you have adequate protein. There's maybe a little bit of positive association having a good and a poor quality forage together that they sort of stimulate a, a more appropriate uh, microbial consortium. But a lot of that was really protein. And a lot of that is kind of in the beef area. Negative associative effects, I, th I think, uh, you know, kind of proud to say that we've helped to reduce those. So maybe by some people's estimates, maybe half as bad as it used to be. But we still have a long ways to go because the computer says NDF digestibility should be X whether it's predicting it or, you know, something based on energy or whatever, and it isn't. And so mm -hmm. how do you deal with that? So uh, like, um, as, as you well know, because you've done some important research in this, a lot of that really evolved around, you know, ha having extra starch in the diet, especially at high feed intakes, fast room and passage rates, and that lowers fiber digestibility. And some of that we've accomplished by decreasing starch in the diet, starch availability, adding byproduct fiber to help slow down the overall availability and so on, having enough protein. And some of it, we still, you know, we still aren't all the way there. So, um, yeah, it's really important because uh, also because that fiber goes undegraded, it could fill up the cow's rumen, decrease intake. So it could be that. But if it goes undergraded, it's a wasted source of energy and it winds up being broken down somewhere else in the manure pit or, or wherever. It's just a lost opportunity in my stamp, from my standpoint. Introducing Ultrasorb R3.0, Volac's comprehensive and complete solution to reduce the negative impact of naturally occurring toxins on ruminants. Ultrasorb R3.0 is a species-specific product designed to mitigate the effects of specific mycotoxins in the gastrointestinal tract of ruminants. Ultrasorb R3.0 also offers lipopolysaccharides binding capabilities. Endotoxins such as LPS can contribute to inflammation in ruminants with energy partitioned to mount an immune response instead of production. Learn more about Ultrasorb R3.0 at volac.com. Absolutely. And you mentioned starch. So if we start our discussion with uh, some of the soluble carbohydrates, so 
how does soluble carbohydrates in the diet affect uh, fiber degradation and, and why? The traditional explanation is all centered around a lower rumen pH. I think it's way more complicated than that. Uh, you know, Paul Weimer and others kind of looked at things related to initial pH. Certainly the cellulitics are inhibited by low pH, but it's, you know, it seems like once you kind of get them off to a good start, they start breaking down forage. They're sort of a little more insulated from that. And uh, so it's really about getting them uh, attached to fiber and start colonizing. So they compete, they decrease the competitors and compete more effectively against them. Once they get going, they probably are able to do a better job at that. So some of it is no doubt pH, but clearly some of it is really an indirect effect that if pH is low, it's because carbohydrate availability is high. And the ones that use starch are the main proteolytics in, in the diet. And if they need protein, they're going to take it. They're not going to give it up to the ones that don't need it. That's their, it just makes sense. So you're sort of shortchanging things like ammonia or branch chain BFA for the cellulitics that do need it. So uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of, we need to look more closely at things related to those kind of concepts and look at things like, uh, um, not just ammonia concentration, but branch VFA concentration, and relate that to the microbes that are there that we can measure and how do we get a more efficient consortium of, of cellulitics and those that work with them and not so much against them. And you mentioned a little bit of the potential of reducing some of the starch in the diet in order to minimize a little bit this issue. Uh, do you have a rule of thumb on when you are formulating diets about which range of starch uh, would work well for uh, dairy cows? And are there other parameters that we have to look together with starch to make sure that this works uh, the way we intend? Sure. Um, I, I realize some, some people use higher starch and some use lower starch. Uh, you know, so it's kind of easy to say something like 30%, you know, try not to go over that, but some people do and are very effective. I think if you do go over that, of course, you need to be careful about having enough effective fiber and all those things that are kind of unrelated to our conversation. But the more starch, the more available in the rumen, the more rumen integrated protein they need. You know, if you kind of keep those in line, there's probably a better opportunity to support better fiber digestibility. And, uh, you know, so some computer models are trying to do that and are, you know, making some success at it. I think we still have a ways to go to try to be able to do that. But yes, yeah, an overall rule. And then, you know, uh, Nasum and other people have tried to comment about trying to keep starch in line with uh, with effective with forage NDF and so on like that. So there's opportunities to use higher starch, but you just got to really remember if you lower fiber digestibility, it's the unseen part that you're that you're doing. You're adding that starch, but you're not really getting what you think you should get out of it. And I'm not really sure. One of the things when I give presentations, people ask, well, then how do you overcome that? Well, okay, you can, uh, you're not getting milk, so you start kind of adding more, more starch. Well, then, uh, then you know, it's, it, it just sort of leads to this uncertainty of how do you keep adjusting to get what you want. And so uh, I, I sort of feel like if we can just get them balanced in the first place, that's the way to go and then work on other uh, important parts of the diet, like the forage quality and so on like that, sorting behavior. So sorry, I kind of meandered there. <laughs> no, no, that was great. And certainly a lot of good things for uh, people at home to think about on how to better implement some of those diets. Looking to maximize your herd's potential? Elevate performance with Kemen's cutting edge encapsulation technologies, including rumen protected choline, methionine, and lysine. Kemen's advanced choline and amino acid technologies ensure precise nutrient delivery, boosting milk yield and enhancing herd health. Trust Kemen, the experts in encapsulation, to take your herd to the next level. Learn more today at kemen.com forward slash dairy. But you mentioned a little bit about rumen pH and how important that is. So 
is there any potential to use some feed additives that can help with either limiting accumulation of lactate or increasing uh, rumen pH that could be used in diet formulation strategies to help mitigate this issue? Sure. Um, a, a really important point. You know, we've actually fed lactic acid and it's not the lactate itself. It's the accumulation of it, as, as, I, as I know you know, but maybe your listeners so, it is, so if we actually make more lactate, that might be a good thing because it route, it's more likely to route through propionate and less likely to route through acetate. So it should be lowering methane and, and perhaps providing more energy for the animal. But the accumulation of it, of course, is bad because it's a much stronger acid, about 10 times stronger per mole of acid. So uh, I think it's not the lactate production, but the, but the usage of it. And some of the bacteria that are, are, or even protozoa that are good at using it, if we can stimulate them, uh, that's that's a good thing. We help to make sure that it never rises and then sort of start, start setting things off to a, to a, a bad pattern. And the more the more the pH rises and the lower the pH is, it can lead to sort of like a a wave effect that more and more waves, and you start getting kind of less and less healthy rumen. So some of the additives, uh, you know, like for example, yeast is pretty pretty good uh, background of being able to demonstrate how that would how that would occur. Um, so uh, uh, there's lots of other ones. I've included them in my in my chapter that I think you're kind of referring to. Um, so menensin probably helps to decrease lactate accumulation. Um, there's some other microbial additives that probably help to do that. Some people are adding um, a, a propionate producing bacteria that can also use lactate. One of the things I, I've always thought is if you actually put a little bit of sh supplemental sugar in the diet, you're kind of stimulating the natural lactolytic or lactic acid break, uh, the ones that break down lactic acid, you're sort of stimulating them on your own. So long as you don't get uh, an inhibition of the ones that you want. So that's the real thing is to build up the lactolytic bacteria. There are several additives that re that purport to do it. And, um, you know, but yeast is, is, in my mind, is the one that's most well researched. Absolutely. Not just yeast, but yeast product, yeast extract. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. And, uh, and I think there are a lot of good research out there that people can refer to when studying some of those additives and getting some nice information about, about them. Exactly. So we are reaching now the end of our first episode with Dr. Firkins. Uh, Jeff, thanks for joining us today. I appreciate that. I'm certain that everybody at home will be really looking forward uh, to the continuation of this discussion. Thank you at home for joining us today. And please do not miss uh, the next episode, which will continue this great discussion with Dr. Firkins. Thank you very much. Hey, everyone. We are always searching for the latest and greatest research to share weekly. If you have a dairy nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and share it with us, feel free to email the details of your research to hello at wisenetics.com. Thank you and hope to see you soon.